Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay. As you can see, I'm on location. I just spent a week interviewing Daniel Ellsberg for an upcoming documentary on his book, Doomsday Machine. And that's an appropriate uh, thing to be talking about, this Doomsday Machine, as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff felt it necessary to call his counterpart in China in order to warn him that sounds like that if you think Trump's mad, he probably is, but don't worry, it's not dangerous. We're not going to attack you. Uh, in the context of this increased, uh, increasingly tense Cold War and increasing talk of nuclear weapons, uh, it's all a rather terrifying proposition. We'll be back in a few seconds with Larry Wilkerson. So now joining me is Larry Colonel Larry Wilkerson, who was the chief of staff to Colin Powell when he was sex state, but he was also special assistant to Colin Powell when he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So Larry has had a, a real inside view in how the Joint Chief operates. Uh, and so I'll go right to Larry. So thanks for joining me, Larry. Good to be with you, Paul, even if you are in Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> so Millie apparently is concerned, and, and what we know about the context from various books and reports that have come out, that Millie believes that not only is Trump deranged, mentally deteriorating, but that there's a right-wing coup in progress. Uh, this is leading up to the events on Capitol Hill on January 6th, and apparently has a real uh, either a real fear that Trump might start something with China. But at the very least, he seems to get intelligence that the Chinese think Trump is about to start something with China. And he calls his Chinese vis-a-vis -vis to calm things down. So what's, what's your take on this? I mean, the, there's a big debate about the, was it appropriate to make such a call in terms of the chain of command and, and, and his duty to report to the president? Although I think the bigger question is, how dangerous is the situation with China? But maybe start with the first thing. It's an interesting set of circumstances. And let me say right from the start, I don't know that any of the reporting is accurate or accurate to the extent that one could make these kind of value judgments. Andrew Basevich, for example, has written a piece, I just read it, um, Millie Should Go. Several others have too, and then others have defended him. I wouldn't go that far because I don't know. I wasn't there. I didn't hear the telephone calls if they indeed took place and so forth. But let's just speculate for a moment that the reporting, such as it is, and I know Bob Woodward's reporting and know that it is often grossly inaccurate. Um, I don't know about these other people, um, but let's just surmise for a moment that it's fairly accurate and look at it from the perspective that you just described. First of all, if he did call the leaders of China, then he had to be deeply, deeply concerned that this president, Trump, was mentally unstable. Um, and maybe even worse, maybe that mental instability led into others influencing him to do things that Millie thought would be severely damaging to the country. Um, so if that's the case, I personally don't have a problem with Millie doing what he thought at the time was circumspect in order to do everything he could to preclude any of that um, result. I do have a problem with the civil military relationship, but I don't know how, and, and breaching it as it were, but I don't know how we judge, evaluate, sanctimoniously pontificate about that when we don't know the exact circumstances. And we do know one thing, Paul. We know that Donald Trump was a moron. We know that he was a mafia-like moron. We know that he had incited people to where they would do something like 6 January. And looking at it from Millie's perspective, after he had been trapped into that promenade to Lafayette Square and St. John's Church, looking at it from that perspective, I would have to worst case it. You're already, as a military officer, going to worst case it just by habit. But I definitely would with Donald Trump. I would worst case Donald Trump all the way to the graveyard. 
because that's the only way you could possibly survive. Indeed, that may be the way the nation survived, as you more or less indicated in the run-up. So I'm not one to take Millie to task for doing something that at the moment and in the grave circumstances that surrounded him, he thought was circumspect and right, and indeed might have prevented a nuclear exchange. You and I both know how dangerous that is, and we both know how easy it is to do. The, uh, there's been other reporting, which I haven't seen repeated uh, in the recent conversation about Milley, but apparently Trump was seriously trying to instigate uh, an attack on Iran and, and was either talked out of it or and the military didn't want to go along with it. But he was, the idea of a kind of wag the dog event seemed to be under very serious conversation in the White House. I think it probably was. And I think it was from the perspective of Donald Trump. This is my own view now. I have no proof of this. But from my reading of Donald Trump, that was not big enough. It would have had to have been something bigger to really wag the dog that he wanted to wag. Um, and I think his preoccupation from the time that he realized, whenever that was, I suspect it was even earlier than the final returns that he had lost and was in his mind, convinced he didn't lost or doing that politically anyway, um, he forgot about leading, if he ever knew anything about it. He absolutely neglected the government from that point on and focused entirely on restoring himself to the presidency for another term, whether it was by revoking the vote or whether it was by storming the Capitol. He was intent on doing that. And so in that absence of any focus at all by the principal leader, indeed the person who decides on use of nuclear weapons, as lamentable as that state of con of uh, decision-making is, I, I still can't bring myself to believe that the American people support the president of the United States, that the Congress of the United States supports the president of the United States having exclusive authority to use nuclear weapons. Um, but in that situation, I go back to my original comment. Uh, Millie was right in doing what he did based on my reading of the situation. And as I said, I don't know everything. Now, me sitting, reading the news and watching what was in the public domain, uh, came to the conclusion very early that a coup was in progress prior to January 6th. You have the public letter on January 4th and the 10 former secretaries of defense. You have Admiral Stevardis supporting that letter, saying that the acting uh, secretary of defense doesn't have the backbone to stand up to this president. Uh, and I got a feeling the Chinese know more than I do. I mean, they, they must have enormous resources aimed at trying to understand what the hell's going on in the U.S. government and, and, and what I, might and be coming at them. Precisely. And, and I will almost guarantee you that they were seriously concerned, if not scared. I mean, if Millie's concerned and, and Haspel from the CIA is concerned, and these secretaries of defense are concerned. And I have to add, on January 4th, on the same day as that letter from the former secretaries, just to remind everybody, because I seem to be the only one that remember, keeps repeating this, the Financial Times had an editorial that said a, a coup is in progress. So the Chinese are looking at a coup is in progress. All these official sources are saying this crazy right-wing white-wingers. And I think it's not as simple as crazy right-wingers. I think it's, it's very important, if I understand what's going, been going on, it's a section of the military that's really controlled by uh, Christian nationalists and maybe far-right Catholics like Opus Dei. A lot of crazy fascistic kind of forces were behind all of this. And the Chinese are looking at this and, and, and get perhaps some other intelligence that Trump is actually has some serious wag the dog ambitions. I mean, it's no doubt Millie thought the Chinese might take all this very seriously. I'm sure they were in Beijing and also in Tehran. Um, and let me just reinforce what you said there. On February the 6th, as I recall, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin issued a directive to all the services. He told them to take a full day, stand down for a full day at their convenience, but do it quickly 
and examine this question of extremism. Um, I think it even said he wanted to report back in a certain amount of time, which was very short. Not a thing has been said. Not that we can see publicly anyway. Nothing Not publicly, a word yeah. has been said back about this examination of extremism in the ranks of the armed forces. I'm sure that was on Millie's mind too. There's no way the chairman or any service chief for that matter, particularly of this group of people, know what the real percentage of these people in the ranks is, even those amongst the officer corps. So maybe it's small, maybe it's minuscule, maybe we're making mountains out of molehills, but I don't think so. I think it's rather significant. I would surmise in the enlisted ranks, it might be as many as a third. And then the officer ranks, you don't need too many to lead that one third. So that had to be on Millie's mind too, concerned that maybe he didn't control his subordinate commanders who are really the commanders, didn't control the entire US military. And what did that mean? What did that mean on January the 6th? And what did it mean in general with regard to Trump's taking back his presidency as it were? Uh, this Admiral Stavridis, who I just mentioned, who wrote this article in Time Magazine supporting uh, the 10 secretaries letter. Uh, he had another article a couple of weeks later, which essentially called for purging the armed forces of the, this extremism, that, that there's been no attention paid in recruitment. And how can you extreme. do that, though, when you, when you can't recruit sufficient numbers for the all-volunteer force, when you've had to go to women to the extent that they have and are still going to women to the extent that they are, in order to make up for the men you can't find, when you have to take mental category fours, when you have to excuse drug use, something we said we'd never do again, that's what they're doing now. When you have to put 9,000 non-commissioned officers out to be recruiters, um, damaging their careers in the long run, then offer them a bonus when they recruit well so that they'll stay another year or two in that job. That's a brigade, Paul. That's a brigade of NCOs. I mean, you know, a combat brigade of NCOs. That's what they're having to do to recruit. So if you say that you have a problem with extremism or with Christian nationalism, which is almost the same thing, then you're saying lots of young men and women who might have a predilection to come into the services aren't going to because you're making it inhospitable for them. So they're, they're, they're hoist on their own petard here. They don't know which way to turn when I say they, those leaders who care about their services, they don't know which way to turn. And I think they're, they're uh, afraid of the force of this Christian nationalism. They have a lot of clout, of both, not just in the military, but obviously electorally. Yeah. And the president uh, of the United States has national prayer breaks, breakfasts and invites Billy Graham before he passed away to come in and orchestrate a country whose constitution says you're not supposed to be here, Mr. Graham. <laughs> right. I have an interview up on the website now with Daniel Ellsberg about these events. And he tells the story of what happened in 1983 when Andropov, then uh, prime minister of, of Soviet Union, uh, thought that the uh, Reagan was planning a first strike. And was getting ready for a preemptive strike, was on the edge of a preemptive strike. And to think that the Chinese aren't having to think about this, that if, if you've got a crazy president and he can't be restrained, uh, you can't allow the first strike to come because uh, the Chinese don't even have that much of a second strike. They have some, but not, nothing compared to what Russia and the United States has. And we, we but, are now incentivizing them and I think the Central Party School and the strategy think tank of China has already made this decision to build furiously so that they get to the point where they have a first strike ride out capability and a second strike retaliatory capability. That means lots more nuclear weapons. But that means going from 300 to 600, as in their arsenal right now, to somewhere around what we and the Russians have around 4,000. That's a horrible thing for us to incentivize. It's insane. It is. And the, uh, and the, you know, the only logic you can make out of this 
It's certainly the conclusion Ellsberg comes to. This is, has nothing to do with strategic defense. No. This buildup is, is, is about how much money gets made building this stuff. That's right. That's right. It's all for the complex. The significant but niche nuclear weapons complex, complex is just as politically powerful as the rest of the complex. When you look into who owns the 12 companies who make, primarily make American nuclear weapons, they're primarily owned by the same financial institutions that own the rest of the military industrial yep. complex and most of the media and, and on and on. And you look at the one that handles things like Hanford in Washington, where there are accidents that outstrip Chernobyl in their potential waiting to happen. Um, it's Bechtel. <laughs> and, and Bechtel, that famous fort builder from Iraq and Afghanistan, forts that nobody wanted to man, um, is all powerful there and linked up with not just DOE, Department of Energy, but Department of Justice and Department of Defense, so that whistleblowers like nuclear physicists who want to blow a whistle now and then can be taken care of most efficiently because you've got justice in your pocket and you've got energy in your pocket. So I had said before the interview, we were going to talk about this in a separate interview, but I think it's kind of natural to go to it now. So what do you make of this submarine deal with Australia? Um, it, 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 it makes, on the face of it, just makes no sense. It's not like Australia can do much of anything with it. It doesn't, it's just a provocation, it seems, and a money-making operation. But what Actually, the hell is Australians going to do with it? Yeah, if I'm looking at this from Beijing's point of view, you know, the last flight I made, Paul, with Richard Haas and the policy planning team was from Sydney. We were supposed to go to Canberra for policy planning talks with the Australians, but Canberra was off limits for some reason. I can't remember why. So we had them in Sydney and then we flew straight to Hong Kong. And I had a good chance to think about, as I looked at the map, as we flew up the, the strategic geography of the South China Sea and the vulnerability of the Southern rim of China and so forth. When you look at it from the Chinese perspective, nuclear submarines coming out of Perth, for example, uh, that's scary. That's scary for you because you're you're almost in a position where now, if not in a position where now, you are the hegemon in the South China Sea from a naval and air perspective. In other words, anybody else contesting that has to fight their way in and they're fighting on exterior lines, you're fighting on interior lines. Submarines change that equation with each platform, whether they're attack submarines or ballistic missile submarines. They change that equation because you suddenly now have eight, if the deal goes through for eight, nuclear submarines don't have to surface, can stay under for extended periods of time, are heavenly weaponized in your lake that can do all kinds of things. And the attack submarines, the astute class, for example, that the British have, and that probably will be the bulk of the submarines that Australia gets, are, they're, they're submarine killers. They go after your submarines in the South China Sea. Um, I'd be really worried if I were China. And that brings me to my major point. This is the day, the initiation of the Second Cold War. That's Patrick Lawrence had a piece in Consortium News. I recommend it to you. Very good piece. Um, this is, he, he puts it down. This is the beginning of the second Cold War. And at the end of this Cold War, the empire will be gone. Well, at the end of this Cold War, we could all be gone. Yes. That's not his implication, I don't think, but it certainly is a possibility. It's a potentiality. Well, the thing I don't get about this, if you get to the point, that submarines are targeting submarines and the Chinese are trying to take out the Australian submarines and the Australian submarines are taking out the China. I mean, if you get to that level of conventional war, there's just no way, I, I, I think, and from what I understand, that's gonna stay conventional because one side is gonna to start to lose. And I mean, it's I not guess it really, could be a stalemate. It's not really conventional. Imagine. It's not really conventional, even in the sense you just said, strictly speaking, because some of those are boomers. Some of those are ballistic missile submarines. So 
you, you lose this ballistic missile submarine, you're going to do what you need to do before you lose it. And you're certainly going to do what you think you need to do after you lose it. And that's probably go nuclear. And, and I think what makes people think that could never happen is they just can't imagine how any rational general or politician would order nuclear when everyone knows that knows anything about this, that it's essentially the end of organized human life and probably all human life. How do you order it? But, but I'm, I'm learning from Ellsberg and he showed me this document. Uh, one of the, you know, this document's been reported on that is probably still classified top secret, but he showed me this. And, the logic in 1958 was uh, in a fight over Taiwan that Eisenhower had, had said, if you can't win this conventionally, you're authorized to win this fight with the Chinese over Taiwan with nuclear. Now, it turned out the Chinese decided not to push it. But if you can imagine the tensions over Taiwan, and, and if it gets to that level, do you think the logic from 1958 remains, which is, We'd rather fight nuclear than lose a conventional fight over Taiwan. I think not in the general sense because of what you've just implied, that we all have had a lot of history now, escalation history, escalation study, um, the kinds of things, for example, that Rich and Colin pointed out to the Indians in the PACs back in 2002 when they were thinking about firing nukes at one another. That's a residue that's still with us, I think. But your point is well taken from the perspective of the way the military in particular, in both Russia and the United States, are talking again, like they did in the 50s, about the utility of battlefield nuclear weapons and the concomitant rationale that you can ride it out if it's small, if there aren't too many of them. Well, that neglects what I just spoke of, the escalation theory that we, we really labored to produce over the 50s, 60s, and 70s. That says you can't do that. You, you simply can't do that. It just doesn't work that way. And by the way, that's what Colin and Rich told the Indians in the PACs in 2002, too. You can't fire 20 and expect them to fire 20 back, or maybe 30 back, and then use fire, fire 40. You're going to unleash your arsenals. And it's going to be everything. And you're going to be flames from one end of the country to the other. And by the way, you're going to flame us in Colorado and flame people on the steps of Russia and everything else, because you're going to prevent them from ever growing another crop, or at least for a long period of time, nuclear winter and all that other business that we know more about now. So yes, you're right in the sense that that residual information is still there, but I think we're forgetting it. Every day that goes by, we are getting closer and closer to being that person Santiana talked about. You know, the only thing you learn from history is that you learn nothing from history or that you forget it. Um, so given all of this um, and given Biden's talking about the need for cooperation with China on climate, which is clearly the overriding issue facing humanity other than the threat of nuclear war. Right. Why the hell do the submarine deal now? It, it, I, it's, it's such a that provocation. Was, that was uh, the Consortium News article's point. Uh, it just makes no sense unless you are, if you're just utterly committed to the, the, the template that the only way the complex, your political power is ensured is through another Cold War. That's the only rationale you can come up with. I agree with him. I agree with him. That's the only rationale you can put on this deal. It, it makes no sense. It makes no sense at all unless you are utterly intent on a second Cold War and going back to those conditions that pertain during the first Cold War, which were highly lucrative for politicians, pundits, journalists, and for the complex, well, highly I, lucrative. It, maybe that is is the banality of it. That, it is. That it is about the bloody money. It's not even as much about the geopolitics. It's about the, you know, the billions and billions of dollars in this contract. Who was it? The philosopher? I forget him now. Was it Nietzsche? Someone said the banality of evil is its most compelling aspect. And that's what we're talking about. 
you know, one of the things that I think gets overlooked in, in terms of its significance, when people look at the Iraq war and the events of 9-11 that led up to it, that $7 billion contract, a no-bid contract that Halliburton got a few days before the invasion, that clearly Cheney profited from. Uh, you know, it's, it's a major factor. That, and of course, they thought they were going to get a big piece of the Iraqi oil industry and so on. How can you and, have and, stock in Halliburton and have Halliburton make off the two theaters of war, Iraq and Afghanistan, $40 billion and not profit? Someone told me the other day, I think it was Lindsay Kashkarian, one of the people that was preparatory for the On Point interview I did uh, on Monday, that the share price increase for the major defense contractors throughout Afghanistan and Iraq was over 1,200%. Man, when war is that profitable for that many powerful people, stand by, you're going to have more of it. There was a Canadian doctor named Bethune, who's very famous in Canada and also very famous in Spain and China. And he wound up helping create the uh, People's Liberation Army Medical Service during the fight against Japan. But he wrote this uh, piece and he talked about gentle gunmen who present themselves as the, you know, the gentlemen, the stewards of society and whose hands are dripping with blood because they're just really focused on the money making out of war. And I, it really gets underestimated how much that drives all of this because there just is no other logic to this submarine thing. And, and, and from I'm learning from Ellsberg and from you, even there's no logic to the number of ICBMs. There's no logic to the whole nuclear war strategy other than, than money, you know, primarily money making. Yep. It's a, uh... It's hard to look at it any other way. It really is. Uh, this, this is starkly so, starkly so. And Boris Johnson and, you know, Biden couldn't remember, the, the man down under, <laughs> they, they, are, uh, they are a trio for all time. I mean, I'm with Macron on this. I, you know, the French have not always been the most stalwart allies in the world, but I understand their angst, and I. But their angst is largely monetary too. What yeah, was it, sure. eighty billion dollar deal or something like that? They had. For I think it was convinced. sixty billion, but was it sixty? If it's sixty, it probably means a hundred by the time yeah, it's done. Yeah, by the time it's done, especially with submarines, because building them is such a long, drawn out process. Thanks very much for joining me, Larry. Thanks for having me, Paul, and I'm enjoy gonna, Southern gonna... California. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to end this piece with uh, we're going to play a little thing from a, there's an Australian television call show called I'm not sure if it's still running. It's called Utopia. And they uh, had a, a very funny skit they did about Australian generals uh, figuring out how to increase the Australian military budget. And uh, it starts with, well, we need a big enemy. And <laughs> yeah. obviously it's China. Anyway, yeah. I'm going to play this now. Well, it's funny. But as, seen as you told me after. Sorry, I know, I know you've seen those two girls, uh, the Australians who go after the prime minister. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, yeah they're and hilarious. Media, we play them all the time. Yeah, yes. they're hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting them. for them to do one on this. But anyway, here's this piece from uh, Utopia, and it will make you laugh. But obviously, don't forget the uh, chilling backdrop uh, as, you, as, as we're laughing at it. I'm for coming in at such short notice. I thought the best way to proceed was to get everyone in the one room. Good thinking. Okay, you're all right. I'll come straight to the point. This white paper is recommending we spend close to $400 billion over the forward estimates. Now, at some point, the PM is going to be asked a very simple question. In order to protect us from which enemy? Hmm. It's so hard to say. $400 billion, pick one. A regional player. Specifically, Colonel. An Indo-Pacific regional player. More specifically? Indo-Asia-Pacific. That's broader. Who are you leaving out? Europe? Yeah, I sort of need a country. Or an unaligned player. No, a country. One that might threaten us, just one. Yeah. I wouldn't want to raise tensions. Where? In this room. You know what? I'll name one and you just nod. China. Yeah, okay. And what exactly are we protecting? Strategic interests. Specifically, Colonel. Indo-Pacific strategic Again, interests. Really specifically. Indo-Asia-Pacific yeah. strategic interests. You know what? Interest. I'll say it and then you nod. 
our trade routes. Yeah. And who is our number one trading partner? Shall we use another system? Sure. China? Yeah. So under this scenario, we're spending close to $30 billion a year to protect our trade with China from China. And that doesn't strike anyone at this table as odd? Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Larry. Thank you. And thank you for joining me on the analysis.news. Please don't forget, this only, uh, we only keep going if you donate. So you gotta go to the website, click the donate button, and please hit subscribe if you're on YouTube. And most importantly, get on the email list so you, so you know when the stories are coming out. Uh, thanks again.